Hey, Cole. You remember how that one time I had mentioned that I had seen that low-budget movie, Killer Pinata, and you were like, oh my god, you should do that? Please tell me you're doing Killer Pinata. Okay, well, I'm not doing Killer Pinata. Oh, fuck you. But I, <laughs> but I am doing the ultra-low-budget 2015 movie, Lamageddon. Oh. My God. Welcome to Second to Die, a horror fiction podcast where we talk about lots of things. And sometimes horror. And sometimes horror. I'm Max. And I'm Cole. And we're your hosts for this episode and every episode. And that noise was one of the presents Cole got me for this past Christmas. It was a screaming goat. And I thought it was fitting. Because we all sometimes want to scream into the void. And it's <laughs> it's this thing that I... I don't know. It cracks me up every time I hit it. It's this little goat and you push it and it does this. That's such a mood. Because that's the no- that is the noise goats make, though. If you don't believe me, Google goat screaming is hilarious. Well, I mean, sometimes it is. There's probably times where goats are screaming and it is not hilarious. Oh, boy. Can you hear the lambs, Clarice? Oh, boy. Have you seen Sounds of the Lambs? Technically? Um, I can only imagine what that means, so let's move right along from that. <laughs> so, anyways, as I mentioned, I'm doing a an ultra-low-budget movie, which is the first one that I've done now. It's funny because I was thinking about when I did Rebirth, that indie horror film, and that guy was like, careful, it's really low budget. And I was like, girl, you do not know low budget because that movie was not low budget. This movie was low budget. Lamageddon was made in... I can't can't get over the title. (laughs) So, Lamageddon was made in 2015. Its budget was $3,000. Which was all acquired through a grant that the two sort of um, creators of this acquired through their university. Oh my god. I'm so excited. I don't have words. So the synopsis of this movie is as follows. Short, sweet, to the point, and accurate. A vengeful llama from outer space lands on Earth and brings death and destruction to everyone in its path. (sighs) Oh, boy. All right. That's a lot. There's a lot happening here. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to be good. And I'm going to go through a little. It's not like there's like a dearth of information and trivia about this movie. It's very low budget. It's very indie. It was made by two seniors from Ohio University. And on that note, I'll point this out. I didn't do a whole lot of research before I started to watch this movie. But the very first scene that there's extensive dialogue is these two, the two main characters, Mel and Floyd, are talking to their mom in a car. And I kid you not, not 30 seconds into this dialogue, I thought to myself, these people are from Ohio. (laughs) Because you know I can point out a Midwestern accent. And I looked it up, and sure enough, these people are from Ohio. (sighs) And you know how I feel about Ohio. If you're a listener from Ohio, hi. (laughs) Shout out to our Ohio listeners. Uh, So, yeah. Basically, how this movie got made is in 2015, there were two amateur Cincinnati filmmakers. I feel like that is probably being generous because I'm not sure that they had made any films before then, but they have now, so we'll call them that. Chet Stedman and Howie DeWin. Only in Ohio do you get away with a name like Chet. I'm going to talk about some of these people's names in a second. These are real names. And essentially, they were joking about making this movie, drafted up 15 pages of notes, and then apparently just made it. It was directed by Howie, Howie DeWin, and then Chet Stedman did all of the editing himself, which took him about a year to do. This is very much so like a personal passion project. Yeah, I mean, good for them. And then they also had a co-writer. It was written by Howie and also Jacques Feline, who also plays one of the main characters. <laughs> he is not French. <laughs> Wait, he's not? No. No. Some Ohio mom was just like, I'm going to name my mom or my child Jacques. So let me tell you, the three main characters of this movie, I'm going to tell you their real names, just so that you understand the kind of people we're dealing with. 
This is Ohio. Okay. Again. <clears throat> Ohio. Again, main- <laughs> if you're from Ohio, like... <laughs> it's all in good fun, but also you're ridiculous. So the character of Mel is played by Pinky Brandweiss. <laughs> Floyd, as I said, is played by Jacques M. Feline. And the character of Trent is played by Gooch Jesco the Third. Oh. Mm-hmm. There's not just one of them. There's three. Literally, the the only character with the normal name in this is the llama himself, whose name is Louis. Louis the llama. It's a real llama, too, in this movie. I can't. I... And y'all think Ford is weird. That's all <laughs> I'm saying, okay? <laughs> yeah. So, okay, back to a little bit of the background on this before I kind of start talking about it. And I'll also say, this movie, it was kind of officially released in 2018, but made in 2015. I'm going to go through a lot of the plot because it's hysterical. And that's just that. If you care about spoilers, whatever. Go watch it. It's on Amazon Prime right now. So, basically, with a budget that low, they said that they had to kind of save money. So, they did a lot of their own special effects using computers instead of, like, actual special effects. Um, And they contacted bands to let them use tracks for free in the soundtrack and then they also did somebody wrote an original score for them as well so that they didn't have to pay royalties on that and in a sort of ingenious way in 2018 when they decided to release it they did a marketing stint by putting it on amazon video with a rental price of one million dollars and 99 cents per rental this of course attracted the attention of many a people but most importantly fangoria and bloody disgusting who are obviously two of like the most giant horror, I would say blogs, but at this point they're kind of like enterprises, you know? Yeah. And so it kind of got them a lot of attention and notoriety. Amazon nixed that price tag a few days later, but they did what they needed to do because it kind of got them a little bit of recognition. And it's actually really funny too. I didn't write any of these down, but when you do the opening movie, like when you start it and the opening credits come up, you know how a lot of movies will be like Sundance choice for blah, 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 blah. They have those with the little like, I don't know what they are, like laurel leaves or whatever. Yeah. And it's like one of them is like official reject from the Sundance Film Festival or something like that. It's, oh, they're, re- they're really funny. The, this movie is actually hysterical. As you know, you saw me pacing back and forth watching it. I was cracking up during this movie. It's. I don't know. Normally, these ultra-low-budget movies aren't 100% my thing, but this movie was hilarious, and I would probably watch it again, maybe. I don't know about all that, but it was it was good. So, okay, let's just jump into it. I've kind of talked about as much background as there can be. And, and Louis the Llama. I'm very <laughs> excited to meet Louis. Louis the Llama, who is adorable and also hilarious. And yeah, also, okay, so I was also thinking, and I know what you're thinking, are there llamas in the United States? Because I really didn't know. And so I had to, of course, look that up. Llamas come from Western South America's mountainous regions. But there were, in 2002, there were nearly 145,000 llamas in the United States. However, by 2017, the numbers dwindled down to fewer than 40,000. And I guess they only do the census every five years, so the next one should be coming out soon. But that's like... Minus 100,000 llamas. So they're not doing too well in the United States. I'm just caught on the fact that there's a llama census. <laughs> it's done by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, apparently. Fun fact. My niece is convinced that my sister's favorite animal is a llama. It's not. <laughs> it is and has always been the wolf. <laughs> but man, she will just be like, guess what mama's favorite animal is? It's a llama. She also refers to our wedding as my first wedding and refuses to call it anything else. (laughs) I mean, that's not wrong. Yes, but there's a certain (laughs) implication to, I had so much fun at your first wedding, Uncle Cole. Uh, Well, that is what it is. Llamas could never be my favorite animals. They spit, and I am not a fan of spitters. I... Soak it in. I'd rather not. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, llama's not doing too well. I wonder what the llama census looks like. Is it just like government workers going and knocking on little like llama mountain caves? How many llamas are in here? That's obviously not what happens. (laughs) Anyway, 
Okay, so that's all I have for background on this because I am going to talk a little bit more about the plot than I have been in of some of the movies in recent. So we're just going to jump into it. Are you ready to hear about what happens? I am. Okay. I'm more invested in this movie than I have been in a movie that you have done in quite some time. It has nothing to do with the quality of past movies. It just has to do with the fact that this is called Lamageddon. Which is an amazing title. Let's be it, real. It really is. You know that this movie had to have been a brain project of two like stoned ass people sitting in an Ohio dorm room being like, dude, what about if we made a movie called Lamageddon? And then they laughed and played the llama song. There's a llama song? You're going to have to cut this, but I do want your reaction because you're very picky about music and the llama song is a fucking shit show. This, my love, is the llama song. Why did somebody make this? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So it's like an Alvin and the Chipmunks kind of a thing. And that's the llama song. This is all right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Another note, too, because I haven't really ever talked about ultra low budget movies. Some might call them B movies. B movies are actually a very specific genre. And when I do one, I'll talk a little bit more about it. Technically, low budget does not equal B movie. B movie is usually a studio movie with a lower budget. Anyways, I think to be an effective low, low budget movie like this, what you really have to master is the ability to not take yourself seriously and go for humor. And this is obviously a comedy horror. You could not call something long again without it. But it is, a, I think, more difficult than people think to achieve it. And this movie 100% achieves it. So I was really pleasantly surprised. I thought I was going to not like this movie, but I actually quite enjoyed it. I'm excited. So... It opens up with some heavy metal music and this animation sequence of angry llamas with red eyes marching. And the llamas get into these spacecrafts that literally look like red painted animal carriers with wings. And they launch off. And then one of them like goes past a U.S. satellite, kind of collides with it. The satellite blows up and the thing plummets to Earth. That's the setup for the story. That's animated. Then we get to the real life version and there's a crash site with the animal carrier. And then the real life llama steps out. This llama throughout the entire movie has glowing red CGI eyes. And so it's like to look evil, but it's just a llama. So it's not like it's making facial expressions. Like they don't alter the face. They literally just make the eyes glow. So it's just like a regular llama. And one of the most hilarious things that's used quite often in this movie is sometimes it'll just be like, a shot of like you'll see like a forest or something or like a meadow and the llama's head just pops up with glowing <laughs> red eyes <laughs> i laughed literally every single time it happened it's hysterical okay so there's this couple on a farm and the girl is like <laughs> so the llama is like behind the gate and the girl's like oh my god do you see that by the way sometimes the people talk with country accents in this movie i don't know why but for the most part they all talk with that ohio accent so she's like, oh, my God, do you see that? And the guy's like, yeah, looks like a llama. <laughs> and, like, nobody's, like, concerned. I don't think there are llamas in Ohio. I really don't. But everyone just treats it like it's like, oh, it's a llama. So, anyways, it kind of flashes forward to the nighttime and the couple is sleeping. And then you see a llama shadow sort of gently bobs against <laughs> the door. <laughs> and then the llama, like... Like, kind of, like, does its head up, and you hear this, like, weird noise, and then blood, like, splatters across the alarm clock. And so it's like, this is, like, four minutes into the movie. Llama claims first victim. Oh, my God. This is so good. Yeah. So then we meet Mel and Floyd. Floyd, keep in mind, is played by one of the co-writers of this. And so they're with their mom, and they're kind of talking about... They, they're coming back from the funeral, I think, of that couple is kind of the setup. And... Basically, the family gets to the house and, oh, I think those might have been their grandparents now that I'm thinking about it plot wise. And so they get to the house and the llama is still like outside the corral and they're like, I didn't know Mima and Peepap or whatever the heck they call them. Yum, yum. Yeah. Like, I didn't know they had a llama and they're like, oh, I guess they did. But th this llama has glowing red eyes. <laughs> so apparently they don't seem overly concerned about that. They go inside. The character of Floyd is this, like, really nerdy, like, he talks in this kind of whiny, nasal voice, even more so than a normal Ohio accent. And 
Mel so is sorry to any <laughs> listeners of ours from Ohio. Really, I am. Max is from Michigan. I guess y'all have like university rivalries or something. Which I obviously did not care about universities. But anyways. So, okay. So that's Floyd. Mel, the sister, she is like... All I can put this... I'll put it this way. Because this is something you'll understand and maybe our listeners will understand. If you have ever worked in a casual family style dining establishment... As I have. There is always that one waitress who is like... A total mess of a shit show, but super fun and is like always got some party and kind of has that raspy voice. That's basically the Mel character. Oh my God. (laughs) I can name the one who worked at both locations of the Tex-Mex food family style restaurant that will go unnamed. Yeah. So I feel like everyone has one of those characters. That's Mel. So I'll cut to this. Basically, her mom is going out of town. Mel, of course, decides to throw a party. So there's this montage of her calling people to throw a party. Some other stuff happens. Not anything interesting. The party starts. It's a bunch of college kids. They're drinking bush light. Vomit. But there is this cute little nod. Some of the college kids on the sofa are having this debate about what is the uh, better Evil Dead movie, one or two. Spoiler alert. It's one. But I thought that was kind of just cute that they were like doing like a shout out to these movies that I obviously love a lot. And then one of the girls says Army of Darkness, which is a great movie, but it's a very different style movie. Anyways, this is not about Evil Dead. I will talk about that in another episode. So they're also playing beer pong and doing drinking games. I've discussed how I feel about beer pong. It is not a part of my culture, so I don't care about it. Anyways, so there's let's get to the fun stuff. There's this girl driving on the way to the party, and she stops because the llama is in the middle of the road, and she's honking at the llama. While doing this, she is text-to-speeching Mel that she's, like, almost there. She's on her way to the party. And she's honking at the llama, and the llama looks at her and then fires laser beams out of its eyes yes. at the car, which explodes. Yes. And she then it's, like, fire around her, and she screams. And then Mel gets a text that's, like, talking about the party and then just, ah! Yes! <laughs> that's exactly where I was hoping this was going to go. <laughs> and it did not disappoint. Yes. So then back at the party, Mel has decided that her goal is to get Floyd laid because I I guess like he's like a loser. And I guess that's just what she's decided to do. So the girl had asked this other random girl had asked Floyd to make him a drink. He goes to the kitchen and tells Mel. Mel proceeds to dump Woodford Reserve Bush beer and Coke into a, like a go cup and then hands it to Floyd. And all I can think of is like. These people from Ohio are just not civilized. God, is this entire episode going to be Ohio jokes? No, no, there's a lot of them. Though, I'm not going to lie. But like, OK, Woodford Reserve, first of all, it's actually pretty good. I mean, I like Woodford Reserve. It's a good bourbon. You oh, one, okay. do not mix it with Coke. Two, you don't mix bourbon with beer ever. I don't know if that's an actual drink. I can tell you this. 12 years as a bartender, I've never mixed bourbon and beer together. If that's some sort of like Ohio thing, please let me know. I will never try that. But like, you can let me know. So, okay, so then there's this other guy. He goes outside to go to the bathroom because I guess, I don't know, people in the country do that kind of thing, so I'm not going to fault him for that. But as he's kind of relieving himself, he sees the llama and is the only person that notices that this llama has fucking red glowing eyes. So he, like, uh, oh, and I think the llama, like, spits at him. And then so he runs inside and he basically, like, frantically slams the door and everyone's like, what's wrong? And the guy goes... There's something wrong with that fucking llama. But then everyone cracks up because they think it's a joke. <laughs> God. So then some other stuff happens. This guy is mad because this girl gets like his girlfriend gets like a dick pic or something like that text. So he goes outside and he sees the llama and the llama ends up. <laughs> the llama kicks him. Through the chest, right as the girlfriend steps outside, and his heart flies, and she catches it. Oh, my God. Yes. It's it's really funny. I mean, the death scenes in this movie are so funny. So then she's, like, screaming. The llama runs over, knocks her down, and then starts, like, smacking her back and forth across the face with, like, fake llama paws. Like, and she's, like, <laughs> screaming. Oh. Yeah. It's like point of view from the llama. 
Oh my god. And then ultimately she kind of gets all bloody and like trampled to death and like that's how she dies is from like llama hooves to death in the face. Oh my god. My book is not going to compare. I'm just giving you a heads up. Yeah, so I got a little bit more about this and I don't want to take up too much time, but like, okay, so fast forward. The house, ha- everyone figures out that the house has a hot tub. So a lot of the remaining remaining people are like, let's go into the hot tub. Also, there's this one guy. I swear to God, I know him, but I don't know how that's possible because it's it was shot in Cincinnati and I've never been to Cincinnati, nor would I ever go to Cincinnati, but he looked really familiar. Anyways, there's a bunch of people in the hot tub. For some reason, one of them is wearing a horse head mask, like literally like the one that my mother got us for Christmas. Yes, my mother got Cole a horse head mask for Christmas. Me specifically, not just us. Don't know why. So, but it's like that exact type of mask. And the, the llama sneaks into the hot tub and like throws in a radio a radio into the hot tub and everyone gets electrocuted. Yes. And so it, it, it's really funny, too, because when the llama, like, kills people like that, there's a scene where it's, like, it looks like the llama is supposed to be, like, sneaking up on them. But it's it's a real llama, so it's just walking like a real llama. Like, <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. I actually kind of want to watch this movie. Yeah. So then Mel's boyfriend, Trent, had shown up. Everyone, they find, the few remaining people find um, the hot tub dead people. Oh, in the meantime, Floyd has gotten laid by the girl that they made that disgusting drink for. I'll call it Ohio Punch. And uh, Floyd's character at that point completely changes. And he is like normal and confident because now he's gotten laid. So 100% not how it works. No. No. So, okay. So then they go outside because they're going to call the cops, but there's no cell service because it's the country. And the llama spits this green goo all over Trent. And then he starts to, like, morph into this, like, llama man hybrid. (laughs) Which is, like, his eyes start to glow red. And then they have, like, him, like, wearing, like, fake fur sleeves and these, like, fake fur, like, ears and stuff on him. Oh, my God. So they basically turn him into a furry. Basically, yes. Yes. This is everything I never knew I needed. Yes. So then the survivors, including Trent, are like, we have to run from this llama. So they're running from the llama, which... Oh, hold on. I totally forgot. There's a random girl tried to run away while they were all trying to get cell service and gets blown up by the llama's eye lasers. And the part that I was cracking up at is she gets blown up. And then they do this flash where they're literally, like, hosing down the rest of the people on the porch with, like, fake blood and guts, like hosing them down from an obvious hose in this way that was so fake but so funny i mean it was hysterically done so then they're like we got to run away so they're all running away from the llama including trent but they decide that the llama can for some reason track them via trent and so then they decide to leave trent so they keep running the llama does not run because it's a regular llama so the llama is just walking through the field and they're, like, running, screaming from this llama. My favorite part is the llama was just trying to live his life this <laughs> entire filming experience. Well, they said that they gave the llama grain every t- every day that it showed up on, on set, so. Aw, so he got paid. Yes. And, uh, okay, so then, for some weird reason, Trent, they switch back to the animation style very briefly to show Trent kind of transform a little bit more. And then one of the llama comes up to him, the animated llama, and like all these like weird like tentacly things like go out and attach to him, and then it cuts, and you're like, that's weird. I thought Trent was absorbed into the llama, like it grabbed him and absorbed him. That is not what happened, and I'll explain it in two seconds. So the rest of the group, which at this point is Mel, Floyd, and this random guy, Dave, find the llama spaceship. And they go in and they discover this, basically this Nerf baseball bat covered in tinfoil that they decide is like a space weapon. And the llama shows up and starts like, and uh, and so then Dave starts to give this like motivational speech. The llama shows up, it fires an eye laser at him and he like knocks the eye laser using the space bat and it works. So he's like, yes. And then he gives this motivational speech and he's like, we're going to kill the llama with this and blah, 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 blah. And then he is promptly blown up by an eye laser from behind by the llama and then it's more blood, like, showered on Floyd and Mel. Classic Dave. 
<laughs> Classic Dave. Meanwhile, we go back to Trent, who has morphed more into a llama person and proceeds to very graphically lay like six fuzzy llama alien eggs <laughs> in a very disturbing scene. How is this done graphically? Not like graphically, like he's like doing like it's like a birthing scene oh. where he's like shouting and yelling and they're like coming out from between his legs. Okay, never mind. I was picturing something a little bit more interesting. No. Yeah. Uh okay. So then Mel's dad, whom they had tried to call I think they did call him before she he shows up. He's also like kind of daddy-ish, to be honest. And he kills Trent because Trent asks him to. And then he shoots the eggs as they're hatching little llamas. Then he gets into a fist fight with the llama, which is like the fake llama paws. And he's getting into a fist fight, which only ends after the llama bites his neck out. And <laughs> so then we fly. Such a shit show. This is getting to a wrap up. Thank God. So then Mel and Floyd are left. They're the only ones. So they're running. They stop, and Mel is like, Floyd, I have to tell you something, because it's this big, like, end of horror movie speech, which is hysterical. And she's like, I used to think of you as just my nerdy little boy brother, but now I see you as my as a man, a little man, as, as my little man brother. And it's this, like, really drawn-out thing, and it's kind of funny. But what's really funny is Floyd goes... He go answers back to her like he's going to do his side of the speech. And he goes, Marissa. And she goes, Mel. And he goes, Mel. Like, I think the actor got the name wrong. And they just kept it in the movie. Oh, my God. That's so good. It was hilarious. It was so well done that I was like, oh, my God, that's fucking hysterical. Because it kind of like in a weird way, like broke the fourth wall. But it was like seamless because he's like, Marissa. And she goes, Mel. And he goes, Mel. <laughs> and it was it was awesome. I don't know if that was scripted, but I will say when I was reading a little bit more about this, there was an interview that I read with the creators of this, and they said that there was a script for the movie, but that it was almost never followed and mostly was just the actors kind of going, making up whatever they wanted to say. That's amazing. I love it. Yes. So things are looking dire because the llama catches up with Mel and Floyd and corners them, but then super cute daddy shows up. And he's got a combine, which is, for people who don't know, like, big tractor thing that, like, harvests stuff. It's got, like, teeth and stuff like that. It's for, like, I don't know, like, what does it do? Like, takes the grain out of the grain. I'm really not. Look, I grew up in a city, okay? I can't handle this. It's a combine. Go look it up. And he runs over the llama. And he then, basically, the, the Mel and Floyd, actually, it's really funny, are, like, what happened? How did you know that that would defeat it? And he goes, well, like most living things, I assume that running it over with a combine would kill it. I mean, at least there's some logic in this place. Yes. Unfortunately, Daddy still has his neck bit out and quickly succumbs to his injuries. And there is kind of these this like funny, it's very, very on purpose comedy where he's like, Mel, you're always my favorite. And she's like, I know. And Floyd's like, that's okay. Mom was always my favorite. It's it's like one of those little exchanges. God. So then the dad dies and then there's an overhead shot of Mel and Floyd and the dad's dead and there's like mangled llama and it pans out and that's basically the end of the movie. No llamas were harmed in the making of this film. No llamas were harmed. And I actually think the llama was treated quite well. Even though in an interview, I think it was a joke, but in an interview they did say that Louis was a bit of a diva. And that would only work if he was given grain every day. Which is, to be honest, kind of like you. <laughs> I mean, come on. I support Louie knowing his worth. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Quick final thoughts. Obviously, I've talked about this movie was really, really entertaining. To be truthful, if you... The low budgetness didn't bother me at all. So if you are okay with that kind of a movie and want a huge laugh... Definitely check it out. It's on Amazon. There's the llama scenes. Oh, my God. If you can make it through that movie without cracking up every time that llama head pops up, then more power to you. Because I could not. I was dying. 
it's not like the most perfect movie, but to be truthful, it was one of the more entertaining things I've seen in a while. So that is Lamageddon 2015. Now tell me what you're going to talk about. Oh, God. So in a complete flip of the script, you're the one talking about a shit show and I'm the one talking about something that is serious. (laughs) I mean, I would... (laughs) I don't see a llama on that book cover, so I'm assuming it's not quite as the same thing. Now, I feel like I should give people even more of a break after the sibling. Oh, God. Are we t- we're not talking about, like, incest or anything, are we, this week? No. Oh, well, that's good. I know. Such a change. So, this week, I am once again traveling to Japan, and boy, am I glad that I did... I will be talking about The Graveyard Apartment by Mariko Koike. Uh, It was originally published in Japan in 1993, and it was not released in the States until 2016 when a translation was done by Deborah Bolivar Boehm. I'm guessing here. The cover, which was designed by Young Jin Lim. Again, I'm trying my best with pronunciations. Um, It's a lone high-rise apartment building in the middle of a graveyard. One would assume it is the graveyard apartment. Uh, The building was photographed, because I'm just trying to give all the credit that I found on the covers. Uh, The building was photographed by Eduardo Ripple, and the image was photoshopped onto stock scenes by Lim. The blurb is refreshingly straightforward after a couple of vintage horrors in a row. A young married couple hiding a dark secret move with their little daughter into a brand new apartment tower built next to a graveyard. As strange and terrifying experiences begin to unfold, people in the building start to move out one by one until the young family is left alone with someone or something lurking in the basement. You will never feel comfortable in an elevator or basement again. Hmm. Couple of things. As someone who grew up in Florida, I did not grow up with basements. I'm already uncomfortable in basements. (laughs) Thank you. As someone who has gotten stuck in an elevator, I'm already uncomfortable in elevators. Thank you. Yeah, I had basements. I grew up with a basement, but it still creeped me out. This apartment building, it really reminds, I don't know why, but it really reminds me of the apartment building that I lived in in Germany when I was working in Berlin. It has the exact same shape. It's kind of weird because it's just this tall rectangle, like rectangle building. There was no graveyard around it, but like with the same like, windows like there's nothing ornamental about it it looks like it and funnily enough back when i used to write short stories i wrote a short story about that building being kind of like haunted and the big like craziness was from the basement Ooh, yeah it's called kirkenberg strasse 64 that was my address in berlin that i used to live at Mm. yeah anyways side note we'll see what other coincidental similarities are there oh my god what if she stole my uh, well this was way before i lived in germany so yeah All right, so let's introduce, at the very least, the main family. Again, I'm trying with the pronunciations. So we have Tepe, who is the husband. We have Miseo, who is the wife. And we have Tamio, who is the daughter. The secret that they are harboring is, I guess, dark and scandalous, but it's not like murder or anything. Um, Also, you find out in the first chapter what it is. So lame, dark secret. Hmm. So it turns out that Tepe and Miseo were having an affair while Tepe was married to his first wife, Reiko, who committed suicide when she found out. Yeah, that's not good. So no incest, but we have suicide. Uh, So yeah, that puts a damper on things pretty much from the get-go. Obviously, Tepe's family isn't exactly pleased with their relationship. Tepe also does not think very much of Reiko. It's Like, he says a lot of, honestly, really gross, disrespectful things about her. Hmm. That's not cool. Yeah. No. No. Hmm. No. Um, But Missio actually has, like, a huge amount of guilt over what happened. She doesn't necessarily feel guilty about the affair, but she feels guilty that that affair led to a suicide. Yeah, that's fair. She even insists on keeping ancestral tablets for Reiko for their Buddhist shrine. Which is a little weird. Hmm. I bet you there's people in the bywater that do that. 
Oh boy. Um, <laughs> for people that don't know New Orleans, the Bywater is like our Williamsburg. It's like the most hipsterous hipster where you try really hard to be the most hipster hipster that ever did hipster while also at the same time paying like $3,000 yeah. for your rent. Anyway, the book opens with the family moving into what appears to be the perfect apartment. There's room to grow. There's lots of windows. Uh, there's just a few strange flaws, the biggest of which, obviously, is that the building has a cemetery on two sides and a Buddhist temple on a third side, crematorium and all. You know, I'd always, when I was younger and stuff, we would pass houses that were adjacent to cemeteries. And I always was like, would I care to live there? And I don't know. I don't think now it would bother me at all. But I do know that there's a lot of people that I think would never do that. And I think property costs on houses like that is much lower. Well, and then also due to religious beliefs and things like that, a lot of people have big reservations. But it's funny you should mention that. Because I made the mistake of reading Goodreads reviews. Oh, no. And there is one in there of someone who was like, I don't understand why they're making such a big deal about living next to a graveyard. I personally would consider that a plus, but I guess that's just me. And I've been to Japan before and no one said anything about having reservations about living next to a graveyard. Oh boy. The look on your face is exactly the face that I made. Oh my gosh. I wanted to like Nancy Pelosi clap. I can't even like comment on that. I've been to Japan. Hmm. Okay. Well, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> let's get back to what? You can spend an entire episode insulting Ohio people, but I can't insult people. I, the problem is, is like people who say stuff like that get under my skin. When I make fun of Ohio people, it's obviously in jest and I love Ohio people. And if, to be honest, I think we actually do have listeners in Ohio and I appreciate them very much and I love them. But people who say things like... People who act like they're authorities on culture because they went there, like, to go to, like, some waifu pillow convention annoy me. Let's just put it that way. That was the kind of comment I was trying to get out of you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, moving on. Um, oh, actually, I didn't even remember that this is in my script. I personally think it would be really cool to live next to a cemetery. Uh, you know that I would love to live in a haunted house. But I wouldn't want what happens to the family, so I guess maybe not. Also, there is the basement. The basement is where there are storage lockers for everyone, and it is only accessible by elevator. That seems like a really poor design. Oh, and that poor design will factor in many <laughs> times throughout this story. There are no stairs to it, and you might be thinking to yourself, that's some mighty intense heavy-handedness. And you would be right, of course. What I think saves it, though, is the author doesn't act like getting stuck in the basement is some big surprise like it happens several times yeah i mean it would ha it would have to i feel like that has to violate so many fire codes it, it, yeah. a lot of stuff that happens in this building violates fire <laughs> codes okay um but it's like the first time someone gets in the basement everyone's like oh no and the second time everyone's like really again i, I would just never go to that basement but that's where your storage locker is. So, you know. Store things in your apartment. It's 800 square feet. Which for Japan is like super spacious. But. Yeah. I've lived, I don't know. I've lived in pretty small spaces before. But no. So I think that really just like. I don't know. I have a great deal of appreciation for the fact that the author just like leans into it. And like doesn't try and make it a shocker. Sure. On their first morning in the apartment, their pet finch named Pioko is dead. I have no comment because you know how I feel about birds as pets. I know. I know. Uh, they shrug it off as a consequence, but what's really fun is Tameo, the daughter, soon starts claiming that Pioko comes to her at night and tells her about all the horrible things of where he lives now. It's like really typical kids saying creepy shit. And yeah. it, it's lovely. Also throughout the, basically the entire course of the story, Museo continually finds finch feathers scattered about. So we can just assume that Pioko is haunting the apartment. 
Yeah, I'm probably ghost bird pooping all over the place. God. So soon after that, a featureless silhouette appears in the TV and it won't go away. Like, no matter if the TV is on or off or if they unplug it or whatever. And Tameo shares that Pioka has told her all about the faceless people and the terrible, awful place that he lives now. Faceless people are scary. Yeah, no, it's great. So Misio eventually learns that there were plans for an underground shopping area that stretches from a nearby train station to the apartment building. Okay. And it was meant to be like a cluster of buildings, and they were all kind of connected by underground tunnels to this long shopping hallway. I mean, I'll buy it. Subways are kind of like that, you know? I mean, all I could think about was that one um, subway connection in, was it Barcelona, that was like a quarter of a mile long? Yeah, the really long one. That really long hallway. Just that, but with stores. I also, okay, so, fun side note. My hometown used to have two shopping malls. One of them has since been torn down. But before it was torn down, it was basically like abandoned. And you know how I love abandoned buildings. But the anchor stores would still be open. So those are like the big stores. Yeah. And then you could still walk through the mall to get to the other anchor stores. But there were no lights. Hmm. It was awesome. As a creepy little teenager, I loved it. Yeah, it sounds fun. Like a place I would hang out at. For anyone who may be curious, there is actually a blog post by someone who writes a blog about abandoned malls. I don't know. University Mall in Pensacola, Florida. It's actually fun to read. Anyway, side note, it is about this time in the story that we experience the real horror, which is one day when Misio decides to feed Tamio a lunch that is noodles doused in ketchup. That's like what um, Honey Boo Boo used to eat, Sketty. Oh, God. Except it was ketchup and um, margarine was the sauce on noodles. What the fuck? Yeah. I've never seen Honey Boo Boo. I've not really seen it too much, but I've seen clips of it. And that's like people will like be like, oh, Sketty. It's because they used to like literally like melt down like country crock and ketchup into a sauce and put it on noodles. People are wild, man. People love ketchup. I have never felt the need to interact with that show. I grew up with plenty of experience with white trash. See my previous reference of Pensacola, Florida. I am proud white trash, by the way, just like so everyone is aware. (laughs) Most of the horror action in this book does take place in the basement. Characters will get stuck down there and the elevator will stop working out of nowhere. The first time that this happens. Oh, my God. I forgot about this. It's hilarious. Okay, so the first time this happens, Tameo is injured, and one of the neighbor children runs to tell Miseo. Keep in mind, this was the 90s, so the idea of letting your child play in the building basement was probably deemed pretty safe here. You were a latchkey kid, so please confirm. Yeah, I mean, we got to go wherever we wanted, so. The elevator isn't working, but that's fine, because another resident enters the lobby as everyone is frantically struggling, and he chants some words, and he lays hands on the doors, and the elevator works again. That that seems normal. Mr. Shoji claims to be able to channel chi through his hands, and so that's how he managed it, which is fine. So Tameo is in the basement, and she's bleeding from a cut on her leg, and she says that she doesn't know what happened. She didn't run into anything sharp. She just looked down and her leg was bleeding. My favorite thing here is that the doctor brings up some sort of phenomenon where an underground area isn't fully sealed and a gust of wind coming through a small space carries a great deal of force because it's funneled through a small space. And he thinks that this caused a sharp object to fly out of nowhere and hit Tameo. And it is called a weasel slash. I mean, I guess I could see that happening if it's an object, but also you would feel that. True. Also, I feel like that's fake. The weasel slash? Yes. The concept of it is not. Now, whether or not it has to do with like specifically being in basements, I don't know. But the idea of a gust of wind kicking up sharp objects that slash at your legs is not fake. And let me tell you why, because I did research, because I'm a librarian. The name of this phenomenon comes from the legend of the Kamaitachi, which just makes me think of... Of of course, the Kamaitachi. Everyone knows that. Well, I'm about to tell you what it is, (laughs) but it makes me think of Don't Trust the Bee with Shitaginashi. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Tall slut, no panties. 
Don't Trust the Bee is a marvelous show. And if you have not watched it, you should. It has nothing to do with horror, but it's just so good. It's quite good, yeah. Um, so Akamai Yutachi is a yokai or spirit that takes the form of a weasel riding a dust devil and it slashes at people, either with its claws or with a knife that it holds in its teeny tiny little <laughs> paws. <laughs> but this is a thing. Uh, I talked about yokai when we did uh, the Japanese horror. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's cool. A little weasel. I For some reason, I guess because my mind doesn't 100% know what a weasel looks like, so I'm picturing like an otter, but even still like a little furry animal holding a knife, riding dust devils, like slashing at people. That's cute. Yeah, no, I, I, I really enjoyed it. It was probably my favorite part of the entire book. So things start to go downhill pretty fast as residents start moving out. Um, most notable of the moving out scenes is when the neighbors who had the kid who told them about Tamayo being in the basement, mm-hmm. as they're leaving, everyone is down in the lobby saying goodbye, but the doors won't open. And that's when, in the creepiest scene in the entire book, one that actually gave me chills, handprints start appearing on the doors as if hundreds of people are holding the doors closed. Hmm. That's kind of cool. They eventually just go away, though, and all is well. And here's where things start to get batshit. Because you know I love a good story that gets batshit. Oh, yeah. Like, truly batshit. So our main family is looking for a new place to stay at this point. They find a house, but the night before they are going to sign the final paperwork, it burns down. They find another apartment, but it won't be ready for a month. So, oh, no, they have to stay in their apartment for another month. Of course. At this point, the managers of the building also move out. So it's <laughs> it's just the Kanos, which is their last name. It's or their surname, but it is just the Kanos. No one else. We find out somewhere in here that the reason the underground mall didn't go through was because moving all of the graves properly would have cost too much and the temple didn't want to do it. But the tunnel was still dug, which disturbed all the graves above it. Oh no, I wonder what's causing the haunting. Maybe don't dig under cemeteries. The night before the Kanos move, Tepe's brother, Tatsuji, and his wife, Naomi, stay the night. The next day, all of the doors and all of the windows are stuck and suddenly become indestructible. Oh, and the glass doors and windows in the lobby fog over. The movers show up, but they cannot hear the Kanos shouting for help from the inside, but the Kanos can hear them, and they hear the movers shout, and then there is silence. Hmm. So Tepe and Tatsuji go up onto the roof, and the moving truck is gone, and there are two blobs on the front steps. Knowing that the electrician and the phone technician will be coming by, they decide to write notes asking for help and drop them off the roof (laughs) of the building. Okay. Which is fine. It eventually works. The two workers show up and they find them and they get back in their cars to go and get help. But just then, a bright light shoots out from the building into their cars and melts both of them alive. Yikes. So everyone at this point is reaching a point of desperation. More time goes by and they're running out of food. So they go down to the basement for protein bars. Oh, sorry. I completely forgot. Because the entire time, apparently some previous corporate resident had left several cases of non-perishable meal replacement bars in the basement. So they go down there for food. Okay. Obviously, it's just like a a plot device to get them into the basement. Right. So now there is a hole open in the back wall of the basement. And they can see the underground shopping arcade. And they can hear voices. And Tatsuji thinks that it's people who can help. And Tepe doesn't think that they're human. So Tepe and the rest of the Kanos stay back while Tatsuji and Naomi go through. And sure enough, they scream. Ghostly laughter fills the basement. And then there is a heavy slithering sound heard approaching. And that's when the Kanos just go back upstairs. (laughs) I mean, that's what I would do. And in the final scene of the book, we have an omniscient perspective, seeing that the Kanos are still trapped. And we know that a heavy slithering makes its way to the elevator, and the book fades to black as the elevator opens on the Kano's floor. The end. Oh, they don't even say what it is? Nope. Mm, That's kind of, that gives me a little bit of horror blue balls. You don't even know if they die or not. We assume that they do, though. 
I don't necessarily mind knowing if they die or not, but not explaining kind of like what the big horror is is a little bit of a letdown. I'm not going to lie. The horror is sketchy. We covered this. What if the slithering was a giant bag of like ketchup covered noodles? <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Anyways, what did you did you like it? Uh, all in all, I liked this one a lot. Actually, it was very interesting. It was fun to read. Like I said, the scene with the handprints was like genuinely creepy. I am going to give it four out of five meal replacement bars because I had a lot of fun. So if you were in the graveyard apartment, would you get killed? Absolutely. So they're not renting. They like signed a mortgage Mm -hmm. to buy this apartment. And this may come as a surprise to you, Peaches, but I'm very stubborn. And you would have a really hard time getting me to agree to leave a place that we had a mortgage on. So make sure you're ready to live someplace before we move in. (laughs) Would you die in Llama Apocalypse? Llamageddon. Llamageddon. Well, probably. I mean, if I most of those people died, to be honest. (laughs) I don't think I would try to fist fight a llama, but the the eye laser beams were pretty intense. So I probably would get killed. By the cute little Louis the Llama. <laughs> I'm just picturing him trotzing across the field. Are you looking for the goat? It's by the computer. I was gonna show you I was gonna show you a picture of it. Oh my god, it's even worse than I thought. <laughs> oh, I love Louis though. He's adorable. He's so cute. Precious. But yeah, he probably would kill me. And that's that. Primarily because llamas are mean. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. If you would like, you can find us on social media on Twitter and Instagram and Goodreads at Second to Die Pod. You can also email us questions, comments, concerns, or suggestions. Reasons why Ohio is actually a great place to live. <laughs> I was literally just about to say, don't tell me about how mean I am to Ohio. Ohio is great. It's fine. I have plenty of people that I know that live in Ohio. Not really, but I mean, I'll say that if it makes you feel better. But that email address would be second to die pod at gmail.com. And remember, if you can't be first, you can always be second to die.